Rob, and introductions first? Yeah, oh. I'll, I'll start. When I'll start. You are streaming live on Facebook. Here we are. I see us. Let's Hello, everyone. Hi, Ricky. How are you? Good I am afternoon. Ricky. Good evening. How are you? Fantastic. Hey. Um, we are here today for The Doctor is In. And I'm here with my co host, my, who I adore, Dr. Monique Gary, and two breasties who I adore, Nunny Reese and Mama Carmo, and Dr. Keith Crawford. So, Dr. Keith, you know, you're the first man we've allowed on our show. So and see, he's actually muted right now. Is that a, is that a sign? Uh -huh. He's on mute. <laughs> so, I, I, follow, I follow my instructions well. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> you three to the head because if too much testosterone comes out, we're going to just shut you out of the Zoom, okay? Oh, but we love you. Oh, we love you. And we want you here. We want you here, Molly Singh. So, so let's go around and do some brief introductions. Mo, you want to go? Sure. I can do it. Um, I'm Dr. Mo. I am the co-host of this show. I am a breast surgical oncologist and medical director of uh, the cancer program at Grandview Health in Sellersville, Pennsylvania, which is just past the Little House on the Prairie, um, right before they, get, they hit the wishing well on the Big Red Barn, uh, about 40 minutes outside of Philly. And um, I am so pleased to join you guys and, and, and have this discussion tonight. You don't know what it means to me, to our patients. Uh, and so welcome uh, everyone, our, our panelists, and our viewers. This is real, relatable, and reliable, and we're, we're bringing it to you live. So welcome. So Nani, who are you? I love you. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me hey, everyone. I'm Nani Reese, and I am an MVC angel advocate, and I'm also a certified medical assistant. I was diagnosed in 2017 with MVC, and um, I appreciate you guys having me on, and it's good to see you. Great, great. Good to see you. Great, good to see you. And NBC means metastatic breast cancer for those who yes. don't know that acronym. And her angel advocacy work is with Tiger Lily. So we're proud to have Nani B representing us and the work she's doing and just her, her humanness and her being is so amazing that she's blessing us with her time and energy. And so thank you for being on Nani. I didn't want to brag about myself that much, but okay, thank you. <laughs> You're a rock star. I like that. You're a rock star. <laughs> And Mema? I am Mema Carmo. I am a 14 year cancer warrior, survivor of triple negative breast cancer. I am the founder of the Tiger Lily Foundation, which I founded while in treatment going through breast cancer. Um, I founded it, and uh, you know, before we begin talking about equitable and equities and disparities, we need to end um, disparities of women who are, of, who are younger, not getting access and treatment. And then we expanded to women who were metastatic and now we're facing, working on with women who are facing disparities. Um, so the, the, the crux of our work is helping women who are facing disparities of age, stage and color. And I'm proud to be, uh, to be here today amongst all these wonderful people who I love and adore and who are all in their own right badasses and grateful to be alive and to serve those who are in need right now. Thank you. Great, great. And Dr. Thanks Ricky Keith. and Dr. Mo. <laughs> and Dr. Keith, our first man. All right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm kind you sound of like Jay Z. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> like the, the Hugh Hefner of, of the Doctor is in my friend. Right. Right. I'm trying to. I'm kind of honored just to be the first. I didn't know I was the first one. I well, oh yeah. And um, but I'm um, at Thin Prostate Health Education Network, um, and I focus on the cancer that's um, for men. But I'm the clinical trial and education director there. And it's our belief, knowledge is the best defense. Yeah. And what we're seeing is now we're moving into personalized medicine and genetics. So there's really a crossover between breast and prostate cancer when it comes to understanding clinical trials and understanding these new next generation personalized therapies that are coming up. So I'm here to help lift and, and help in the fight. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So today we're going to be talking about equity, advocacy, and access. And our conversation started with some information that we received, um, some stuff that's going on in North Carolina where Nunny lived. Um, but I'm going to let, let Dr. Mo kind of break it down to you because it really leads to a bigger discussion about having information, having, you know, 
equities, addressing disparities and, and access to care that we all need so desperately. And we need it to be real for all of us and, and right for all of us. So Dr. Mo, do you want to talk a little bit about our issue today? Um, I can. And it was very interesting the, the way it arose, but essentially to give a little bit of the, the medical background and not get too technical for people viewing, um, when a patient is given chemotherapy, certain types of chemotherapy, uh, it targets the fastest growing cells in the body. And this is exactly what I explained to patients. Now, I am a surgical oncologist, um, but it's important as the, the, the leader of the team to explain to my patients what's going to happen at every phase of their treatment. And so as I talk to a patient about what their diagnosis is and what they may need, we talk about medicine. Medicines are typically given either uh, orally or IV or through a port, um, and occasionally they'll go through the skin. And so chemotherapy in general, as it relates to breast cancer, uh, the cytotoxic or the kind that target the fastest growing cells deplete not only um, your hair follicles, your hair cells, uh, your eyebrows, your eyelashes. Uh, it also targets things like your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your immune system. So those cells, we see that uh, patients have changes in their fingernails, which are fast growing, your GI or your gut, the cells inside your, uh, your intestines every seven days regenerate. So a medicine that's going to target something fast growing like a cancer is also going to target those, uh, those issues and those organs. And so medication is given after chemotherapy in order to help boost your immune system. Uh, some of the medications are given, um, we don't necessarily have to use brand names, but uh, Nulasta, Nupigen, Filbrastin, there's different medications that are administered either through uh, multiple injections, through a single injection, through a patch or a, a transdermal delivery system, not necessarily a patch, but an injection system through the skin. And so the goal of those is to help the patient who had just received a cytotoxic medicine boost their immune system so that they can continue to move about and not suffer side effects like um, uh, neutropenia or loss of their, their, uh, their immune system, their white blood cells and neutrophils that fight infections. And so when we talk about cancer patients being at risk, this is why they are at risk for opportunistic infections. This is why we've got our cancer patients being extra vigilant during COVID because they may be undergoing therapies that knock down their immune system. So medications are given to those patients in order to boost their immune systems. That's the short version of it. There are multiple cancers, not just breast cancer, uh, and also transplant patients for whom this is a reality. Dr. Crawford, you wanna weigh in any on, on the colony stimulating growth factors and these types of medications? and some of the side effects you've seen from patients who maybe opted not to get it or even uh, to get it, some of their side well, effects. I mean, Mo Moni, you hit the nail on the head for, for what people need to understand. Once you decrease or attack the cancer, your, your white cell count, which is needed to defend off viruses and bacteria and COVID-like infections is weakened. And so to have something that um, you can take that boosts up the immune system is so important because yes, you can't kill the cancer and then come down with an infection and, and decrease or change how a patient responds. So you basically hit everything everything there. It's just a way to help boost your immune system and to protect you because something that was interesting too, and I maybe jump to, the, to this, is that during this emergency right now, the federal government is telling everybody, okay, you know, use the following precautions that you would use with the flu. Stay away from the hospital. If you have flu-like symptoms, um, protect yourself. So there's got to be an alternative to protecting yourselves. Well, even, even when I had cancer, you know, it wasn't when COVID was happening. And um, it's funny because I think, you know, I was told, wash your hands, stay home, stay away from people, don't hug and minimize your, you know, activity. So, so all the things that, are, that everybody's being told about how to avoid COVID is what breast cancer patients do every day, right, Nani? I mean... I was wearing a mask and we're, we're trying to protect our immune systems, you know, anyway. So if there's a way to do that with a drug, I mean, we all had to take this drug to, to, um, to protect ourselves is what people should be doing right now for COVID anyway. 
but Would it's still you, more mm-hmm. elevated for us as <clears throat> patients than taking chemo, right, mm-hmm. Nani? Yeah, yeah, that was something that we was already practicing. So, um, and because of the fact of the COVID, you know, we had to be more careful and just had to practice a little bit more because of the fact that even with myself, you know, being in the hospital uh, for the last, what, two months, um, it's just, just seeing the people in and out uh, for different reasons, um, in the hallway, coughing and you know, I don't, I didn't want to be exposed to that, but you know, like you said, we've been practicing that. So that's nothing new for us. Right. Right. But you know what I was going to say that there was something new was with COVID they changed or how often or who, who is prioritized to get screening and get particular treatments. So to a certain extent, they're pushing off treatment options. And then those are the type of things that um, if you have a chance to provide a therapy um, following the normal course of therapy, that's important. But during this COVID period of time, this is pushing out people um, to the fringe of the limit of them receiving treatment. I didn't, I didn't know if that happened to you, Nani. Nani? No, I'm sorry, Nani. Sorry. He gave you a new name, Nani. <laughs> that's your new nickname Nooney. <laughs> um actually it, it it have because of the fact that um like i said i've been sick a lot for, in the last two months and having to go to my doctor was just difficult so when i'm in a hospital um the treatment that they were giving me for one i had to get tested each time that i went up there i had to get tested for the covid which is a very uncomfortable thing and um, so even just reaching out to my doctor and she's not available for me at the time because, you know, in a telephone or Zoom conversation is one thing, but actually being there with her, not being able to, you know, get a physical exam from her in a doctor office um, and having to, I think I missed one treatment that I had to reschedule. And for me, because of the fact that I, I'm not stable, missing treatment is very, is, is something that shouldn't be happening at all. Because me missing a treatment can actually, you know, have my progression even to, to kind of move along faster. I mean, it's, it's just, you don't need to miss any type of um, uh, treatment. And how far away do you live from your treatment center? I live two hours away. Two so hours. yeah, two hours. So if I happen to get sick, you know, and, and thank goodness I don't have to have the medication on the list. And so um, I'm blessed and not having to go through that. What I did, I wanted to call my insurance just to see um, if I was covered. And I am covered, you know, when, once I get for authorization, I am responsible for a copay. But um, even so, having to drive up there, because after chemo, you know, I'm already in pain. I'm already dealing with the nauseas and the vomit. I'm I'm always dealing with the body pain and I don't even want to get out of bed um, because I'm so sick. And so imagine having to drive two hours away to my doctor office after leaving. Um, that's a difficult thing because sometimes you just can't move because that pain is so difficult. Now, to take anything after chemo, before I did take a medication for bone pain um, because I didn't work, I had to stop. It helps with my bone pain, the medication that I have to take, but other than that, I'm not having to, to take anything um, after my chemo. And my wife- So, there, was, so there's an the issue of like your pain, your pain, the fatigue and exhaustion, and then the cost of traveling back to the hospital, which, oh, yeah. which again, then you're entering an environment that maybe people are walking in the halls and coughing and there's COVID and you're immune suppressed. So there's multiple challenges you're facing. There's the physical issues, there's psychosocial, the fear, anxiety around that. There's a cost prohibitiveness of going two hours there, two hours back, two hours again, two hours back. And so those things are all things that are, could be, you know, if you could, or didn't have, if you had to have the drug, you would be at, at a disadvantage, right? I mean, it'd yeah. be a problem. Oh, yeah. it, it'll be a problem because not, not, like you said, financially as well, because uh, a lot of times when you go to the hospital, you got to pay for parking. So you got to think about yeah. things like that, you know, so there's, there's all kind of other financial things. And then you have to think about the fact emotionally, you know, you having to go to um, see your doctor or be in the hospital by yourself. So there's a, a, a lot of things that comes along with it that makes it really difficult. So I wanna jump in here. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I want to make the audience aware, if you haven't already been aware from our, our previous episodes, that during COVID, Dr. Uh, Crawford alluded to it, all of the treatment algorithms, many of the treatment algorithms have changed. So with respect to things like surgery, the timing of when we're doing surgery, we have put patients on pills to um, bridge them to surgery, to shrink their tumors because hospitals have not been safe to do surgery and we've needed the extra equipment and the ventilators and that sort of thing. You know, in certain places, the operating rooms are, have, have been full of patients who have COVID, the PACUs have been full of patients. And so the changing of the treatment um, pathways has come through a rigorous process through different medical societies. It's not one doctor deciding I'm going to do something different for you. There has been a, a science and a bit of a method to the madness uh, and insurance companies, because we did talk about, you know, insurance covering certain drugs. This is not an indictment against insurance companies per se, but insurance companies are now trying to catch up as well and figure out what are the best practices or things to do for patients based on the new guidelines and how we're treating patients. So the standard of care may have changed changed, but it is it has changed in conjunction with your doctors and their medical societies and lots of people weighing in on what's safe for patients. So I think that's an important distinction to make at this time is that if your treatment has changed and you're watching, you know, your doctors may be talking about your treatments resuming, but it hasn't just changed based on an arbitrary insurance company's decision. A lot of uh, thought goes into how your treatment changes. Now, whether or not your needs and your specific drugs are covered, that's where we get into the weeds a little bit. And that's how this conversation evolved because we found that some patients were not able to access certain drugs and enter Ricky uh, with, with your, um, with your op-ed. Dr. Gary, before we go to that, can I ask, so one thing I've, I, that's been an issue for patients is the oral parity issue. You know, if I'm, it's really admirable and that how fast the response has been to pivot for patients to be able to still access care and receive critical life-saving treatments. However, when, when a patient, if, if I'm wrong, correct me, has to get a drug that is oral, they can't get it from the pharmacy and have it at home, but the cost associated with, with the drug not being administered in the hospital setting could be more exorbitant, which again is a barrier to for many patients uh, of, of any color, particularly those who are living in underserved communities may have financial challenges and also may be far from the pharmacy and so forth. Can you, mm -hmm. so Tariki, you can expand on that, but that's a, a whole other issue, right? You're, sure. you're absolutely right. Oral parity is a huge issue and part of the financial toxicity of cancer um, because we know that it's not just losing time from your job. It's not just the cost of uh, certain surgeries and certain medications, but it is having the types of medications that you can afford. You know, I have patients that show up for chemotherapy and if they get slapped with a $10,000 bill, it's either, am I going to be able to pay my mortgage and my kid's tuition or am I going to get chemotherapy today? You know, and so, you know, financial toxicity is huge and oral parity is a, a, an issue that I know you have mentioned and had some, some town halls about, but you're absolutely right. It, it not only matters what drugs you get, it matters how you get them, how they're administered. How you get them. Well, I, 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 was, I also wanted to, to say one thing is this talk is so important because hopefully people are watching and they're hearing survivors stories, um, healthcare providers, and advocacy groups all together talking about a period of time that we don't know the true extent of how cancer patients are gonna be impacted. The average person doesn't even understand what a comorbidity is. Now you have cancer with a comorbidity and then COVID. We have to have a dialogue so everyone's on the same page. You can't just make uh, make a change in policy or funding or care without really recognizing how it will truly impact the patient. And we don't know. And so we need to be as cautious as we possibly can. And that's how this really came about, Keith, you know, so, and I, I'll put the link to the article I wrote this week um, in the, in the um, comments, but I, I just was talking to some other breastfeeds, some friends of ours, many in North Carolina, and they were talking about how they were not going to be able to get um, this product called New Lester On Pro. And that basically is the, is the red cell growth generator that you take after chemo. But, you know, before COVID, they were getting it by getting a shot or going back the next day. And this particular product 
is something you put, they will, the nurse will put on your body while you're at chemo and you have, it has to be administered within 24 hours of chemo. So they put this thing, it sticks on you and I'm not scientific, so it sticks on your body on your arm. And then in the amount of time needed, 24 hours, it releases the medicine into your body. So the cool thing about that product is, guess what? You don't have to go back to the hospital. You don't have to give yourself a shot. You don't need a caregiver to give you a shot. And, and you don't have to risk being at risk for COVID again. So it's a really great product. So I was questioning why would, why in this environment would an insur any insurance company or any healthcare provider deny access to that particular product? Now, I'm sure there's other ways to do it. And, and um, I mean, you know, when I was sick, I, you know, I am not capable of giving myself a shot. I mean, I'm a wimp. So, you know, I had, you know, have caregivers. I had a friend who was a nurse. My daughters took turns doing it, but, but um, there was no way in hell I was about to give myself a shot in the stomach. Sorry. So, so this is almost like a, like a, 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 a PPE for breast cancer patients, something like yeah. that. It is, it is because it, it's, it's, it's a, it is because it's a way to protect them from getting COVID and protect them for giving COVID to their families. Right. And especially like Nunny who lives two hours away, she's got to get in her car and drive, whatever, she's not feeling well. And then, you know, she could potentially get the virus and bring it home. And so- Some people have caregivers who are older. Like when I had cancer, my mother was taking care of me. You know, she wasn't that much older as she is now, but still there's that risk of really infecting people that you love and care for and right. care for you during right. treatment. Right. Right, so it, it's, it's almost like like they don't listen or think about the advocate, you know, yeah. the patient that's diagnosed with the cancer, like what we're having to go through already, and like you said, like Dr. Crawford said, making changes um, and not thinking about the the patient, you just can't make changes like that because it affects us. Like you said, I have a, a ten year old son. I don't want to have to bring anything back to him. Right, he get infection because of the fact of you know, changes that haven't been met or my, our treatment plan is having to be met. It's not being met. So uh, it's almost like they don't listen. If, you, if you're not the one that's going through it, it may be hard for you to understand it, but you have to listen to the advocate so you can understand how it feels when we tell you it's difficult to get out of bed, to go and drive two hours away to have something done when you are already in pain. Right. And, and so yeah. this is like a challenge. Yeah, that physicians face when we want to prescribe certain medications, order certain studies. You know, if I want to get a PET scan, but I have not ordered an MRI yet, or I would like a certain type of medication, but it's non-formulary, meaning it's not uh, covered by the insurance company. Um, there, there are reasons and there are nuances to what we do and why we do it that insurance companies may or may not take into consideration. Their goal is to always fail on the cheapest thing and then escalate to the next thing, which, when you know, in happens, the setting of perhaps, in, in, well, in the setting of not a pandemic, not a worldwide, a global crisis, you know, it, it's not always an unreasonable approach. If you can take a cheaper PPI and you get the same result, I, I get it. We have to save money somewhere. But where is the grace, I think, and the consideration for what we're facing right now with this pandemic and the challenges with access to care, the, the reasons why people should not be in the hospital at this time, and all of the other things that factor into why a, a patient might benefit from one medication over another. And I think that we, we have to pivot this conversation to begin to talk about how to advocate for yourself if you find yourself at any time, especially during this pandemic, but at any time you find yourself in need of um, a, a strategy to get what you or your physician feels is in your best and or life-saving interest. Right. I think it's really powerful, Ricky, you, you know, the way you use your voice and none is now as well. You wrote an article that got, you know, a lot of attention and you wrote it because you were concerned. And I feel like a lot of patients don't feel like they have that power. Um, as uh, uh, Everybody does. We everybody. all do. And, you know, when I was a patient, I had a different job working in government contracting. I had no idea the power I had to move and change uh, the course of policy and, and across the board or empower advocacy advocates, you know, on a, a global scale. Um, but it's really important to us as an organization and to me to use my voice because that voice multiplies. It's like the butterfly effect. The more you talk and ask questions, even you asking a question through your through your your post, Ricky, created a more a deeper conversation. And now it you know we can have the payors and the physicians and 
other people looking to you and saying, well, we need to be more thoughtful about our approaches um, and how we engage patients. And I feel like most physicians, more, more, most, more doctors, most doctors, they care for patients. People go into the healthcare um, yeah. space to support and love, but then they have to be cognizant of our perspectives. And that's why your voice, Nani, is so important and getting other advocates to speak up and use their voice is so important. And, and because I want to, I want to mention, I want to mention one thing when, when um about the MRI is is one of the things that I find is absolutely ridiculous. And I had a, a some of my breast to mention this, especially some of the ones that's in the, the lower income. And you know, you can be at your chemo center and have and have an MRI, and you're there, and you your, your treatment is two hours away. Well, they will schedule your MRI for for the next day or something that you have to get done. So you have to drive all the way, not because of the fact my insurance needed it, needed to take time or anything, it's because something that, you know, wasn't available. And I know sometimes, you know, the schedule can get um, yeah. tight, but to have a patient come back two hours away when they're already there, I don't mind waiting if I have to, but, and especially the fact that I have brain met. So that makes the, the that makes it even more complicated because the fact I'm dealing with, you know, brain meds as well, but, you know, the facility has like to Matt, honey, explain to people what brain meds are. Yeah. Brain meds is um is when the tumors is in your brain. And I had just finished whole brain radiation, which is um brain radiation, which is pretty much kind of shrink the tumors. The plan is to shrink the tumors that's in your brain. And I had good results from that. So I'm thankful for that. And um, but when you're someone with brain meds, you know, you deal with a lot of dizziness, you deal with a lot of headaches, you deal with a lot of vomiting and not being really nauseous. And that puts you on a whole nother level. So to have that person having to travel back home is ridiculous. And it's like the facility doesn't think about that. Yeah. See, all those, all these little, all these things that you're talking about clearly impact the quality of life of the patient and adds more stress to the patient. Well, and stress can impact your impact your health. Yeah. You know, especially when you're metastatic. I mean, I, I feel, speak for all patients, but I, I can say for my metastatic sisters, there's an, there's a you know a huge burden on them, mental health wise, anxiety wise. Nani mentioned being in these treatments. We she and I have been in communication when she's in the hospital, but her husband or caregiver can't be there with her. So there's a lot of issues that could contribute to co comorbidities or co other issues that could expound the patient's treatment journey. Um, having to travel, the financial issues and mental health stuff and all of that. So it's really important that, you know, insurance companies, physicians, all, all stakeholders take into account, you know, if you're in the patient's shoes, how would you feel were you having to go through these different you know, channels to get to care? Right. Dr. Crawford, right. I want to ask you, I'm sorry, Ricky, um, I'll, I'll let you go, but then no, I go, want Dr. Go ahead, Crawford. Go ahead, go ahead, babe, go ahead. I, I want you to weigh in on how you... Um, through your work, help patients find their voice? This is a question for both you and also for MAMA. What work do you do to help um, uh, survivors, thrivers, metavivers, et cetera, be able to tap into uh, one, their power, but two, their strategies? How do, you, how do you guide somebody through that process of finding your voice and, and advocacy? It, it's very interesting that you say that. Um, we basically start the way you're starting with a simple dialogue, a simple discussion, and good understanding of the message. A patient wants good treatment, the right treatment. They want the right care at the cheapest possible cost. So from our end, Finn, we're really pushing to having people, patients, survivors, participate in clinical trials. Because one, we have to, we have to, we have to. Yes, because one, we already know that we don't even represent the population and we don't even want to talk about the disparity that exists there because that is a significant disparity. But what we can do on our end is make sure, and what we've done is develop a tool called a fight tool where depending on your diagnosis, you can put in your diagnosis and then pull up any clinical trials in your area. Now we've started to move, we're going to moving in the next direction where we have more interactive relationships or navigators or our ambassadors between the survivor and the person looking for a clinical trial. 
and some of this emphasis is so important is we know our objective is to get the patient to think about how they're going to live. I don't want you thinking about how you're gonna die. The issue is we have to keep pushing, supporting the patient and getting them to believe that they're gonna live. And, and this discussion today clearly benefits. And, and, and I go back and it's just like numbers. The higher, higher percentage of death, and I don't like to talk about it, but the, the, that affects African-American women compared to other women. There are eight states where the incidence of breast cancer is higher than the incidence, where African-American women, Black women, are at a higher incidence than white women. Yeah, That's reversed. So we want everyone to participate in clinical trials, but we want Black women to participate in clinical trials just like we want Black men, because we're not involved. And there, <clears throat> we a woman, like say for example, receiving radiation, there's these new next generation therapies that one could, you receive radiation and, a, and a, a drug could be used to kind of prevent the cell, cancer cell from repairing itself. Those are those, those new, new therapies that if we can just continually buy the um, survivor, um, in this case, breast disease, if you would allow me to use that term. You can. Yes, more time, because if we can get them to recognize that the, the technologies and the therapies that are coming down the pipeline, if you can see, see my background is I'm a PhD, so the, so the technologies that we use in the laboratory are now moving into the clinical setting. And if I can just get people to believe, stay positive, and keep on moving down the line and keep that positive journey, because these next generation therapies are exciting. We just need to participate in the clinical trials. Well, you know, I really believe that, that black breast cancer is a disease. It's yes. different from white breast cancer. And looking at prostate, I'm sure it's very similar. Black, there's black prostate cancer because our mortality rates are so much higher. Was it for prostate, it's like 2.2 times the, um, the rate yeah. for men. Well, for us, it's like 42% higher. And in, in North Carolina, it's 43% higher. So. So I'm all about that. And I think that until we get yeah. drugs that work for our physiology, we're gonna be in trouble. And, and you know, um, Dr. Keith, we're actually gonna do another show, show about clinical trials. So if you're really good today, we'll bring you back. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I, you know, I wanna come back. Like, we want to we want to see a Hugh Hefner jacket next time in a, in a smoking jacket and a ascot. Yeah, we're okay. Ascot. Okay, I'll bring my pipe wanna, next time. The one thing I want to I want to try and okay. say I always tell patients you can't personalize medicine to a genome that you don't understand. You know, this is the age That's of personalized right. medicine. And, you know, we are always going to get what we've always gotten. We will get the, the, the drugs that target everything if we don't know what the targets are. And, and that underscores the importance of what you just said, Dr. Crawford. So I want to back out because I want Mamie to weigh in on how do you educate uh, patients and survivors to become advocates and to find their voice? And, uh, and are there differences between men and women and how they use and how they find their voices when they have cancer? You know, I always say before you, I was a patient, I was a person, and I'll always be a person. And so when I approach my work with Tiger Lily, you know, I really, I started when I was in treatment in the bed. Um, and I had no idea what the words advocacy meant or clinical trials. No one discussed that with me. I didn't learn about that till years after. I didn't know about policy or <clears throat> the power of my voice, but I knew that in terms of equity, what affects one affects the other, as Dr. King said. And I couldn't wait to get better to use the, my message and my story to help other people. I learned that women who are younger had more aggressive breast cancers and, and higher mortality rates. I learned that women were then dying of breast cancer because they weren't educated in time and didn't know how to advocate for themselves. And then I learned that Black women had a, a disproportionate rate of, of mortality. And so as I lay in bed in treatment, you know, and going to treatment, I thought about the human need. As, as human beings, our most biggest need is to be seen and to be heard and to leave a legacy before and when, before we leave the earth and afterwards. And so the work that we do at Tiger Lily is really about telling the patient, you know, you have the, a power that's beyond your imagination. 
Um, many of us find that voice when we think we're facing death. I thought triple negative has no treatment for this disease right now. I, I only have maybe months or years. My daughter was three years old. I was single parenting and I thought, you know, I don't, I cannot bear to leave her. Um, but if I do, she will need to remember me and she will need to feel me. And I want to make the world better for her. As Ricky always says, I don't want her uttering the words breast cancer, you know, and it's been 14 years now. And she still, she knows what breast cancer is because it's not gone yet. And so what I do with, uh, what I build with Tiger Lily is an army of angels, um, empowering women like Nani that we've, you know, met, just she's so amazing, giving them a platform, going to the 20 cities that have the highest rate of, of black breast cancer mortalities and saying, I want the women who don't know about the ASCOs and San Antonio's and clinical trials and, and know how to use their voice and put them at the table as equal partners with their providers, with the insurers, with the scientists and researchers and not just ask to be there, but know their right to be at the table. And so we've spent a lot of time um, building the organization, but I would just tell people, you just can never underestimate your power. I literally am a first generation immigrant, came here with one suitcase at 15 years old. No one gave me, told me how to do this. I just knew that my voice could save lives and I kept moving forward. And so I would say to everyone, you know, your voice is your power, your voice can change the world. Um, there are many of us doing this work in this space, find people that you connect with and, and connect with them on what level meets your needs, whether you're a, a patient that's metastatic, um, it, to learn about more about clinical trials or whether you wanna advocate with a, a different or, an organization, just don't stand by because, you know, I think sometimes we think, you know, I'm sick and I can't do this, but I think, you know, there's a quote I love by Miriam Wright, Edelman Wright, says service is a rent you pay for a living. And right. for me, the price I pay for a living is my, my voice and my breath. And, the, and, and my spirit. And so even if you're doing a blog or you're doing uh, speaking on a podcast, I look at Nani and I speak about her a lot because I admire her so much. Um, I, it brings me to tears whenever I see her face just because she embodies all that advocates stand for. She's in the midst of fight. fighting for her life. Fighting like a girl. And she is, and whenever you say Nani, will you show up? She says, yes. And then I'll see her on a dance party on Instagram, just living her best life. And that's it. what you do as you fight for your life, you live your life and you, you gave that lifetime to serve others to make a difference. And so that's how I use my voice and empower others with a platform to use theirs. Nani, I want to ask you the same question. You know, when you meet survivors, drivers, metavivors, patients who feel like they don't have a voice. You know, they went to their doctor and they left the doctor's office and they didn't understand anything. And they are not willing and not comfortable calling that doctor back and saying, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Or calling that navigator and saying, hey, listen, I'm having a lot of pain. Can you, can you give me some resources so that I can get acupuncture or acupressure or whatever the things are that, that may help along your journey? They can't find their voices. What do you tell them? I usually tell, you know, tell them that, like Mima said, your voice is very powerful. You know, you, it's like you hire your physician. If you're not happy with that physician, you know, get you another physician. If you're not happy with that one, right. get you another one. Because you have to be comfortable with what's going on with your health and your life. You know, you, you have to advocate for yourself because, sorry, like, All right. when you have, okay, uh, when you have a, a, a young child, your goal is to live life. I never say I have cancer. I always say what I'm diagnosed with because um, my faith is strong. You know, my faith is strong in God. And I want my son, I, like me to say, I never say no because I keep going. I feel like if I stop, that's going to interfere with me keeping on moving. When I look at his face, it's just, I have to keep going. And there's a lot of my friends that I grew up with that's diagnosed with um, breast cancer, rather stage one, two, or three, and they feel like they don't have a voice because um, of who they are, because, you know, um, being black, being a, a black woman, um, they feel like they're not given the same chances, you know, um, they feel like they're not being heard. And I'm just like, educating is, 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 is the key, you know, um, start researching things. If you're not sure, if you know someone that's that's um, that's diagnosed with the same diagnosis you have, reach out to them. You know, we have to be there for each other and help each other out. I feel that in North Carolina, the resources was very limited. 
and we didn't have a lot of resources to um, engage in. So when I started looking at um, like Tiger Lily, um, Mima just extended herself, hey, anything you need, let me know, reach out to me. Stuff like that is important for us um, because everybody don't come from a medical background. You know, they don't know what to do. So use your voice because it's very powerful and have a good relationship with your provider. If you don't have a good relationship with your provider, it's not going to work. They have to listen to you. You know, you are the expert because you are the one that's living with the disease. Especially young women, because we find that young women experience significant challenges with getting what they need for diagnosis, particularly because they, you know, they're brushed off by their physicians many times as, oh, it's fibrocystic changes. I'm speaking specifically for breast. Oh, it's a cyst. Oh, it's a whatever. You're too young for dot, dot, dot. Um, and then challenges with getting the types of imaging that they might benefit from because of the density of their breasts and things. And so it's really it important. Is. Mm -hmm. Dr. It Gary, really I, I, will say, I will say that when I got, found my lump, it took me six months to, to get uh, diagnosed with breast with, with TMBC because although I got a mammogram, it came back false negative because I had denser breast. And the doctor, I told her, she's like, this, she said to me, this is the right, this is your answer, you're fine. And I said, the technology that's going to, would discover that lump isn't discuss, isn't created yet. It's not it's not there yet. But I know this is not this is not a benign lump. It's a tumor, and so having had a family, my mother was a nurse, and she impressed upon me early on, you are your biggest advocate. You are your best doctor. If you don't trust this the, treat, the scan or the medicine, whatever, you just don't stop. And the doctor told me the surgeon who's one of the best in D.C. according to some reports and and magazine articles to come back in six months to a year or wait till I was 40. If I had done that, I'd be metastatic right now and or dead. Okay. And, and, and that's why it's so important that as advocates and as women of color, black women, African-American women, I feel responsible personally and professionally to use my voice because the difference between life and death could be a month of getting diagnosed or three months or six months. And so people like Donnie said, people are always like, how do you go so hard? Why do you ever say no? Is that I'm tired of, of you know, going on Facebook or getting a call or a text that somebody died during this past five of uh, two months. Oh I've God. lost five people, but two of them, three of them were, I think two of them, you know, died maybe because they were not getting screened or maybe, you know, having other issues around COVID. I'm not hundred percent sure, but it's so important that you educate your friends about the about the importance of always checking. Don't think it's just a headache or a backache or something, you know, just to blow off because that little thing could become, you know, something that impacts your life. Um, yep. That's why advocacy is so important. So well, important. Can I, there was one thing, I wanted, yeah. one thing I wanted to say, and is this, people who are listening to you right now, these ladies are letting you know you are not alone. This is your team. You have to. We're talking about you control your destiny. You have a team that's around you. That's what I'm talking about. There aren't, it may be virtual. It, we may be virtual. I throw myself in there too, because we may be virtual, but we're with you. Yep. Yeah. But I have to say too that, you know, I think that as an advocate, it's our stories that help build build the you know build the friendship because you know people can see Nani living with brain nets and see that she's thriving and and doing well and being able to be on this on the screen today and and I know that I think I became an advocate really because I didn't even realize that when I told my story it helped other people and Mama too that that that's what gets and I actually I wish that every insurance company every every kind of piece of this chain had a breasty working for them. So if, if a breasty was in that meeting when they decided to change that drug policy, uh, yeah. they would have a different conversation. Yeah. Now you just said something real powerful, Ricky, because yeah. what I heard you say is something that we have been hearing over, over, over and over again in the, in the setting of this civil unrest, which is that if we are, uh, if we are the topic of conversation, we should be at the in table. In the conversation. Oh my God. Table. 
And that's right. why we need like a seat so at the table. That's why there's advocacy like so that hard. needs to happen. Right. right. And I know companies do, some do, some don't. But for everyone who's watching and every company who's watching, if you are discussing uh, the treatment, diagnosis, management, survivorship um, uh, of breast cancer patients, you need to make sure that there is some degree of breast cancer patients at the table. You need to yes. right, yes. pull up. As, as, a leader, as, a, as a leader, as a leader, not as just sitting back, you know, in the audience. Um, I put a post on LinkedIn and I got some not so positive feedback, but I said, if you have a, if you have the privilege of being at the table, either bring a seat or give your seat up. And I don't mean it in a sense that people of all colors don't have a right to have a seat, but some, ta some tables don't have enough chairs, right? Right, or you're right. not invited. So either pull up a seat or give me a give a chair to somebody who needs to be there, like a breastie. Because well, I want to see our I want to see our opinions inform um, clinical trial de um, design, not just engagement or recruitment. We get calls about oh, the people will say, well, can you give me help me get patients in this trial? No, give me a patient. I'll get you a patient to be a part of trial design. Um, right. You know, I don't want to get your campaign when it's already launched. Let me have a patient advisory board as part of that. You know, we have young black women and men in college. Are we investing in company in money? Companies have been giving their time to go and talk about the importance of educating black women and men to go into medical school and clinical the clinical setting. That's where the change happens. It's not just creating an advertisement or a commercial. People need mm -hmm. to be be reached where they are for one in the manner of which they're used to communicating and receiving information and on a consistent basis. It sh and there should be, sh should be investment across the board, like policy, mm -hmm. advocacy. Every, health, every, every, and, every, and that's why we launched our inclusion pledge. Like we have to make sure that we're included in every aspect for this, for us to, to end disparities across the board. Absolutely. We have, and I think we it's have to be in the conversation and we mm -hmm. have to be listened to. So we right. have our voice, but we need for people to listen to us. And, and we get calls all the time about, you know, can you be the patient voice? Can you be the patient? Can you give us a perspective? Um, but that needs to be everywhere in every meeting and, and really listen to what we are saying and how it's impacting us because we know our bodies better than anybody. And I think even with the whole advocacy thing, we, we know our bodies, but, but we also know how things make us feel, how things that impact us. And, um, and I even, I think even the reaction to COVID would have been different had more patients been in the conversation. That's, 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 that's true. Spot on. Because yeah, if, the, the, even when you look at the original announcements of COVID, the, they said comorbidities. Cancer wasn't even a thought of issue. Yeah. There were, they, were, they were talking about, yes, and be respectful to our seniors. There are 33 million people above 80 but 18 million cancer patients. Right. And it wasn't a, there wasn't anyone that said, oh, what about the cancer patients? Right. They were still talking about- Take it a step further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how many of the um, societies that made those guidelines included any patients, any patient, any patient right. advocacy groups, right? Well, right. well speaking huh. of which, you know, I, you know, last December, Tiger Lily took um, about 20 to 30 women of color to San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Um, because I kept walking those halls of SABCS and ASCO, and I'd be one of the only women of color in my position as a breast cancer leader in the in the room. And I would get asked many times, are you a doctor? Are you in medical school? And at first I didn't understand why they were asking me, but many were asking me pretty much like, what are you doing here? What, what are you, why are you here? And I, it occurred to me, and I would keep hearing about lack of engagement in trials and lack of black patients representation. I'm like, well, why aren't people of color here? And so we took women of color to black women to San Antonio. And that was the largest contingency of black women in as SABSCS in the history of the conference. Mm -hmm. So like to your point, Dr. Gary, how do you have the conversations about people that are needed to be reached when they're not at the table? And 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 you know, ASCO was last week and we had a confab, which was powerful. But I want to see at ASCO next year in San Antonio that there are black women on the stage with the scientists. We need to be at the table, on the table, in the front row, not in the audience. So you know what I'm saying? And I've been reaching out to people and saying, why are we begging to be, you know, at the included, table when you're yeah. talking about us not being included? I'm saying I have a woman in 20 cities. They're here. We have hundreds of them. So I think they need to listen to us more, to your point, Ricky. Yeah. Listen to us more and, and 
We want to be on the equal playing field, not begging to play anymore. Mama, I'll take it a step further and say, I need to see you at the surgical meetings, right? Because that's <laughs> exactly. part of it, right? It's not just right. drugs. It's not just ASCO not and, um, and, and San it. Antonio, right. which right. are very, you know, medical intensive. But, you know, you need a say in how surgeries are executed. How about radiation at Astro? How many advocates get to go to Astro and discuss radiation, right? How different might radiation be if it were informed by people who actually had radiation? Yeah. There's a nurse, the, the nurses association as well. I mean, there's across the board and I don't want to pick on anybody. I love Asco and San Antonio. They're my friends and they're, they're great partners, but I think that they're the really cool thing about San Antonio is when we reached out to partner, they were supportive of having us there next year. I want to be on the stage. Same thing with Asco. Next year, I want us to have black women on stage and, right. and talking and having these conversations, not just online, but, or in our own hotel room and having our own conference, but at, as part of the conference. Being at, that, the yeah, being at the table. Being Dr. At the Crawford, table. I need to get you in here to talk about <laughs> men with cancer. There are a lot of women watching. There aren't a lot of men who are watching, although we do have some male viewers. But um, for for men who are, are battling cancer, um, and what, what words do you have for the women who are in their lives who might be watching in terms of how to help advocate for them and, and how to support them uh, in, in their advocacy and in their treatment journey? What about the well, brothers? Well, it, it, you, you raise a very interesting point and a point that I wanted to say. First thing, black men and men get breast cancer. Yes, they do. So don't think men don't. Yeah, and, we, and we've talked about that on the show, actually. We had a show about, about genes and we had one of our breasties, Tallulah Anderson, talk about she, she had the, the BRCA gene from her mom and her dad and her dad and her brothers all had some incident with breast cancer. So we know about that and we know it's out there. And um, so that's, and so now that next step that this point that you just made was that's the future that we're talking about when it comes to medicine. And that is you have breast cancer gene, BRCA gene, but the BRCA gene also can influence prostate cancer and the therapies that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So the important thing that we have is from the, from the there's, it's important. We did a, um, a round table discussion. What we found out is how important for not breast and prostate to be separate entities, but for us to come together, come together because in our round table, we had black men whose who caregivers were black women. And then the roles reversed where now the black woman becomes the survivor and the survivor now becomes her caregiver. And so we're all in this together. And yeah. especially as we look at the genetics that are associated with cancer, BRCA, new studies that have come out that looked at, and this is what I'm, I pray that this is what's gonna be the case. There was a new study that just came out and they've been talking about it where they looked at people with African ancestry and they found this point on the chromosome that is specific for people that have advanced or aggressive disease who are of African-American ancestry. So if that's the case, there has to be the same thing for black women. We just have to find it. To find it. We have to find it. That's, so, why, that's why we and, fight like girls every day. Because we have- So all that's that. why, that's, that's the message we, the, I'm pushing everybody. We got the screen early. We are, our message is to make sure that men, wives, uh, girlfriends, support Partners. groups, moms, aunts, sisters, right. tell your husbands, tell your, 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 your relatives that they Brothers. need to start thinking about screening at age 40. Second- oh. Our, our, we have a simple website. Or younger. Yeah, yeah. Younger we have a simple website where it says rapcancer.org. That's it. Rap, like you rap, cancer.org. And you're not alone. They can call and pick up the phone or send me an email. We will help and get them on track. I and love so that. And so that's, that's, I think, I, I think too. Webinar. Talk about your webinar that's coming up. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, that thing. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, let's we, hear about it. You know, Great we place. you know we have to follow greatness because we're also doing <laughs> talk with your doctor. 
All right. Mm -hmm. okay. So we got to follow greatness. All right. So are women, can women come? Are we, is it just men only? Are we yeah, every, allowed to, to every, bum rush every, to your every, webinar? Everybody's invited. Because okay. the tide raises all boats. I have I have, oh, some, yeah. I have I some old that. I have some country relatives. I got some oh, old fans. So but the tide raises all boats. We want yeah. everybody involved because collectively mm -hmm. we can beat this. That's why I'm here, because I'm banging, banging the drum for breast cancer. Right. Because we need to. If we're in these separate little groups, they can't hear our voice. Yeah. But if we, we come to, together, we have to work together. We have I'm, to. I'm gonna I'm gonna join that that webinar, Dr. Crawford. I gotta be there. I need to be okay. on the place. Sure. I'm a, excited. We're, we're, How can people we're, find you? How can people find you? Um it's uh Finn. Um if they uh P it's with the P, P H E N, or it's Prostate Health Education Network. Can we put that but, in the comments, Ricky? Yeah, I'll put it in. Mm -hmm. Or you can just do rap cancer mm -hmm. and then I'm Kay Crawford at Prostate Health. So Drop me an email. I'm going to respond because this is what we have to do. What we're doing on our end is that we Father's Day is coming up and we're starting a very, just like you, you guys are aggressively accelerate, accelerating your effort right now. And this is what you've been doing is accelerating your efforts because we recognize that we have a window in time to make changes, to get our foot in the door and pry that door open to make policies changes, educate everybody. Because this is this is some this is an educational opportunity for insurance companies. For them to recognize how it hurt people, how it scared people. I think so, it's important for people across the board. When you look at how um, black women are marketed to in the industry, when you go on social media and look at other things and how they're hypersexualized. You know, I think what if what if it, there were more marketing where women of color, black women were used in a way where they were marketed healthcare information. Mm -hmm. The way that the way that their our skin is used for certain things to make to to monetize in certain commercial se sectors, it, it shocks me. And if only a small part of that was to go towards ensuring women had more access. Um, Right. To healthier foods, to treatments, to prevention, to realizing that if they put half as much attention into their health care as their beauty products or yeah. as other things, you know, they would, we could have changed the number of women dying of breast cancer very drastically. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so I, ah. I, I want to call not just in, insurance companies, but every company. That's right. How, how are we protecting people that we, we're using to market to make money from? How are we educating them and, and marketing to them about healthcare, prevention, wellness? When you go into underserved areas, I get mad because you see a Popeyes in a liquor store versus a Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. in a, in a, whereas in a, in a more affluent area, there's more access to healthier foods. People who live in those areas cannot always afford those things. How do you make the investment in those communities and how do you target them and invest money in them to ensure that more, they're, they understand that, that this they really are the ones at the highest risk. Why aren't they being the, the ones being marketed to the, the, the most? Well, was, Mima, we're gonna talk more about that. that. Can I make one we're question? question yeah. One's gonna comment? Yes. Yeah. The dovetail on Mema. There's one other thing too. These pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies make billions of dollars. Mm. Could they take some of that money and mentor or provide research opportunities for upcoming African American women and men Talk about that. doing research in this space. And many of them do, I think, but I think it's mm -hmm. across the board. The corporations should be, I mean, a lot of our supporters are within pharma and corporate, but I, because, uh, and pharma has been amazing with how they've reacted to many, com many of the nonprofits would have failed had it not been for even different people, companies coming to help support and ensure that we continue our work. So I don't want to pick on certain people, but I think oh, that- no, no, I, I was just wanting to make sure that there's a- <laughs> right. yeah, Across yeah. the board, right. Across there the, the board, initiatives. yeah, right. across the board, you know, as these companies are doing whatever they're doing, how are you ensuring that Black women are invested in, in a sense, for their health, prevention and wellness, as much as you market for them in, in, in you know, beauty products or, you know, certain clothing mm -hmm. or, you go on social media right now, all you see is butts. Everybody mm -hmm. wants the black woman's butt. You know, how did that happen? 
It's marketing. Exactly. It's music. It's, I'm being honest. It's it's videos. It's marketing. Listen, it's, we, we could trace that back to the hot and tot. You know, uh, never mind. We're not going there. But that's the next one. We got to get ready to wrap this up. But you're absolutely <laughs> right. We're going to talk more about that and some action items that people can do. Like we're going to yeah. come up with some initiatives and steps that, that advocates yeah. and people who desire to be advocates can take you know, within the corporations, et cetera, like stuff you can do at home. Mama, how can we reach you and find you and ask you more questions and, and join and partner with you? We're at www.tiger, T-I-G-E-R-L-I-L-Y, foundation.org. And you can also email us at info at tiger, T-I-G-E-R-L-I-L-Y, same, you know, F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N.org. Also, we, we just launched an inclusion pledge and it's really asking companies of all across the table, um, corporations, insurance companies, you know, payers, um, pharma policymakers to pledge their commitment to ensuring equity for women of color across the table. And that commitment is not just saying you're gonna do it or sharing our post. What are you gonna do to invest your money where your mouth is to ensure that we have equal access um, for women like Nani? you know, and, and, and all patients of color. So um, if let's you just Google that, the- Let's tweet that to Blue Cross North Carolina. There you and, go. And okay. Can you, Ricky, Ricky can, we, can, we need to put the um, inclusion pledge in the in the chat we'll box if possible. Yeah. Okay. Nani, how, how can we reach you? How can we support you? What, what can we do to amplify your voice and your message here today? Um, well, you could, I'm on Facebook, um, Nanny Reese, and uh, my email is, is keelareese at gmail.com. And, you know, I, one thing I want to say before we, you know, tune out is that make sure when you're going through, if you're new going through this or you've been going through this route, be your own advocate. Make sure you study your own report, you know, ask for your report, study mm -hmm. terminology so you know what it is that you diagnose with so you can understand what you diagnose with so yeah. that if you have questions, you can ask the right type of question so that way you can also make sure you and your doctor, um, your, your teens, you know, team, and you pretty much understand what she's saying and vice versa. So make sure you just, you know, advocate for yourself. And if you don't feel comfortable, you need someone to go with you or talk with you, you can call me. And I'm sure any other breastie. Oh, any of us, right. All our breasties. Yes. Yeah. Honey, can you mention that they can find you on TikTok as well? Because Keith's on TikTok. Yes. Dr. Crawford. Honey's <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> I'm, I don't take and I don't talk. So I, I, I'm trying. To, I'm, I'm trying to work it. So yeah, me and me, me, we stay dancing. So we're always talking because there's different platforms to advocate on. You know, so I go where people where people are. So I, we, you know, we're on we're on Facebook, Twitter. We're on. They yeah. watch Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the younger generations. Everybody's on TikTok too. So we go on there. You make a. You just act, you know. You say what you say. You put a comment mm -hmm. about being your best advocate. People reach out to me all the time and say, you have yeah. breast cancer? Wow. And they ask questions. So use every platform possible. And Nani, I love seeing you dance, girl. <laughs> I love Thank watching you. your moves. Yeah. Keep dancing, Nani. Keep dancing. Uh, before we close, I want to recap on the things that I heard today from people who are watching, who are trying to figure out how to find their voice with respect to advocacy. We said, number one, and Nani said it best, educate yourself. Get all the information you can about your disease, about your specific diagnosis, learn about your insurance, learn about these drugs, learn about the surgery, your options, learn your options so that you can then figure out where you need to go for advocacy. And I heard Dr. Crawford say that you need, and, and also Mama, that it, you need to find your tribe, right? Find some people, find some groups. There are groups every single place, there everywhere. Are, There's several them. of them that are here on this platform, but throughout the social media and the the inter, the interwebs, the whole universe and the cloud too. Find your people so that you can um, align yourself with them so you can be supported and be encouraged to use your voice. I heard Mama say, start somewhere. She said, you know, whether you write a blog, if you do a TikTok, if you do a whatever it is, don't think that that doesn't have power. And it's important for you to own that power and to begin the work of advocacy because that's how you get more confident. And it. it's just it's just to start someplace because this is the story. time and you are the person, right, Ricky? Yep. Tell your story. Tell your tell story. Your, I heard Ricky say, tell your story that your story has power. Do not think that you're one of a number of people or that you are a statistic. You're not a statistic. You're not a case. You're not a docket. You're not a medical record. You're a person. You're a patient. You are a, um, you're a, you're a living, breathing testimony, right? Right. 
Yep. And, and, and so that, that all has, has power and it has purpose in it. And so um, I'm, I'm loving the, the energy here. Um, Ricky, any closing comments, anything? You, you guys can find well, can me. I, I'm Dr. Monique Gary. Can I, Gary. One, can I, can I add, can I add yeah. one other point? One other Absolutely. point? Clinical trials. Clinical trials. Trial. Clinical trials. I know that's we're right. Talk about that. We have, we're yes. gonna yeah, we're going to have a whole segment on it. Why and how and the shortcomings, the limitations, the promises, you know, the potential. I'd love to have you back, Dr. Crawford, to discuss it as much. well. It. Um, and then the pipeline. Back. Mama said the pipeline. That's so, so, so important. You know, I have a master's in molecular biology, doc, and I did not necessarily take the research route thinking it might be uphill. And I knew I wanted to do clinical medicine, but how many of our young people, you know, begin in the science? and get discouraged along the right. way, right? Mm -hmm. And right. and they're not having the, the opportunities that are um, laid out for them. You know, it's always like reinventing the wheel. You right. know, Mamus said something real important. Oh, the last thing you said, Mamus, was that we need to go to the meetings and make our presence felt. Right. And there are opportunities for you. If you are watching, there are opportunities for you to go to these society meetings. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to know it all, but you can get, you can link up with us and you can go and, and see what the landscape looks like and learn how to be an advocate from doing it because th they need to right. see you at these meetings. I need to see y'all at the surgical societies. I need to see you at, right. you know, ASCO and San Antonio um, because representation matters. It right. matters. And it should be at the table. So next week, we're going to talk to um, Dr. Sherry Prentice, and she's going to talk a lot about faith and ministry and being a doctor and being a survivor. She's a breastie, so we'll have a great conversation. Thank you guys so much. I love you guys so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Keith, Keith you were thank so you. well behaved. You can come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I got, you got me all fired up. I said, we're, right. we're yeah. ready to fight. Big love, big love. Right. Thank thank you. Big love. love. Oh, so if I say, how are you? Is that what? It's a heart. It's a heart. Right, boss. You got it. <laughs> so, so here we are once again. We're Dr. relatable, Ken. reliable, and real. Uh, and the doctor is in. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. See you next week. Be safe. Be safe. Bye. 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 Bye.